Hey everyone, for Christmas, remember I bought Lauren a new Fuji Cape May cruiser bicycle from the folks at Cycle Shack on Vanderbilt Beach Road in Naples. Now I can't even keep her home. She's out and about everywhere. And the folks at Cycle Shack really hooked us up. I mean, I never really knew there was so much to cycling. It's a bike. It's just a bike, right? Wrong. Teddy and Jane actually took the time to explain the differences. And there's a different bike for everyone, whether you need a cruiser, a fitness bike, a trike, a kid's bike, they got it. It's a great way for Lauren and I to get out and about and stay away from all the crowds so we can kind of do our own thing. Since Lauren likes to cruise, of course, we got our cruiser. Then we pimped out her bike with a basket, lights, cool little bell, and a new gadget, a cell phone holder, which is a must to allow you to control your tunes and keep safe. Got to keep your eye on the road, folks. If you need to repair a part, a quality accessory, or you just want the best bike for your buck, go see Teddy and Jane at Cycle Shack at 7211 at 7211. Vanderbilt Beach Road, Unit 3. You can start by visiting their website at cycleshack.com. You can call them at 239-331-2065. Or I would actually start by following them on Instagram at cycleshack naples. And they're pretty good about responding to any of the messages that you have. So if you have a question, hit them up on Instagram. It's at cycleshack naples. And be sure to tell them when you go that Paradise After Dark sent you. You, you, you. Convicted murderer who confessed to killing after his arrest in the 1990s is scheduled to be executed by lethal injection in about 30 minutes. Gary Ray Bowles has been on death row for a murder in Jacksonville Beach in November of 1994. Bowles was also convicted of two other murders in northeast Florida and confessed to killing men in Georgia and Maryland. Evidence suggested he targeted gay men. Gary Ray Bowles' killing spree came to an end in 1994 when he was arrested for the murder of a Jacksonville Beach man named Walter Hinton. Bowles eventually confessed to the murders of five other men. Bowles will be executed here at Florida State Prison promptly at 6 o'clock. Police say Bowles has confessed to killings in Daytona, Hilliard, Savannah, Georgia, in Maryland, just north of the nation's capital, and also in Atlanta, Georgia. After Bowles' arrest in Jacksonville, police say he admitted to the murders of five other gay men. In every case, the victims had something like a towel or toilet paper crammed down their throats. All the murders were brutally violent. He needs to be punished. I think he needs to have his life taken just like he took all these other people's lives. But Bowles was able to stay one step ahead of police in each murder, leading to him being profiled five times on America's Most Wanted and added to the FBI's 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list. Members of the gay community called for his execution shortly after he was taken into custody. I don't have any doubt in my mind that that's the man that did it. Uh, and I got no sympathy for the guy at all. I'd pull the switch myself if I had the chance. Bowles told police he wanted the killings to stop. And that's why he confessed to killing a total of six men. According to prison officials, Bowles woke up this morning at 4 a.m. He was calm and he was in good spirits. He's requested as his last meal three cheeseburgers, french fries, and bacon. He's had no family visits and he has not had a spiritual advisor visit him either. I'm Tarek Miner, Channel 4. Hello. I am Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is a bi-weekly podcast covering true crime. Unsolved mysteries. Missing people. Urban legends and the dark side of the Sunshine State. But first, if you would like to support our show, please subscribe to our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Paradise After Dark Podcast. On Patreon, you'll have access to bonus episodes. Our spinoff show, Vacation Edition, discounts on our merchandise, and more. Much, much more. If you have a question, a Florida case suggestion, or you just like to chat, go ahead and email us at paradiseafterdarkpodcast at gmail.com. You people don't understand, Lauren loves to interact with you. So please, if you have a question or whatever, for like the last two weeks, people have been sending her messages. 
I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm responding to someone. So please hit her up. She loves it. Hit me up. And I just want to say happy new year. Happy new year. 2021. I am being optimistic. I am feeling like this is going to be a good year. The, everything that happened last year, I just want to leave it in the past and let's look forward to the future. So far, CrimeCon Austin and CrimeCon UK are still a go. We will be at both events. I'm excited for that. That's going to be like the bomb because when you go, people don't understand that when you go to CrimeCon, it's 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 so you get so involved with everything that's happening, and there's so many different podcasts. So if you love this podcast. You're going to go there and find at least three or four more podcasts you like. And Absolutely. It, and the one thing I like is even the big ranking, high ranking podcasts, the people are regular people. I mean, you know, they, they get yep. on the microphone, they talk, but when you go in, they'll buy you a drink, you can buy them a drink, you can have fun with them. It's really a great time. So make sure that you uh, hit up CrimeCon up because it, it will happen this year. I'm confident. Yes. And if you plan on going to either or both events, please get your tickets now. Use promo code PARADISE21 for 10% off of your ticket, and we hope to see you there. Yeah, I, we have our tickets, right? Yeah, we're guests, so okay, we just, don't need tickets, but... Ken's just clarifying. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure we have tickets, because here we're telling everyone else to get tickets. I'm like, do we have them? So we, yeah, we do have them. We I decided think. to start out this year with a serial killer story. That's a great way to start a new year, right? Yeah, start with a serial killer, you know. But before we get into it, I really just want to quick play you guys a promo from a new podcast that is just launching this month in January. It's called Cruel and Unusual. I think it's going to be great. And listen to this promo. You might recognize a voice. I don't know. Let's hear it. In the United States, thousands of men and women are awaiting execution on death row. Some are innocent. Some are guilty, but all of them are human beings with inherent value and dignity. On this podcast, I will be speaking with individuals who have some skin in the game. People like Michael Braxton, better known as Aleem, who is currently sitting on death row in North Carolina. I had mentioned in the book I had became really, um, you know, violent in my fault. And I had became, I had sunk into an abyss of despair. And I wanted to, you know, I wanted to die. I wanted to get this over with. I didn't see any purpose of continuing to, you know, live and subject myself to this type of suffering in prison, on solitary confinement for so long and seeing no end to it. And, you know, just literally waiting to die, you know, it's by the execution chamber. I just wanted to get the process over with. If this is going to be the outcome, why don't I just go ahead on and die now? And Ken Rose, who has fought for death row inmates in the courtroom, for the past 39 years. I had two clients in Mississippi executed, and um, in those days they were using gas. And I actually watched the execution of Leo Edwards, um, and it was horrific. They tied him to a to a pole to keep his body from um, convulsing, um, but his head was not tied, and his head banged against the pole. Um, while they executed him with gas. So I, I um, have gone through those experiences, and, and um, it's been difficult. It's been hard because I've known the people very intimately and care about them, and known that their lives were worth living and that we should not be executed. I will also be telling the stories of those who are no longer with us to speak for themselves, like George Stinney Jr. In reference to her closing statements, Mullen stated, No one can justify a 14-year-old child tried, convicted, and executed in some 80 days. When asked about whether or not she was concerned about her re-election, she said that she did not care if she got re-elected, and that the thing that most concerned her was the integrity of our justice system and the constitutional rights of American citizens. And Cameron Todd Willingham. Those handling the case believed that it was airtight, and he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. To expedite the process, the prosecution came forward to offer him a plea deal. If Cameron would plead guilty to the murders, he would be assured life in prison rather than the death penalty. He refused this, despite both his lawyer and mother advising him otherwise. I ain't gonna plead to something I didn't do. 
especially killing my own kids. He stated, I hope you will join me and tune into Cruel and Unusual to hear their stories. Subscribe now wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, back to Paradise After Dark show. We're, tonight we're going to talk about Gary Ray Bowles, a.k.a. the I-95 killer. You know, this is a, I like this one because I really, I heard little bits and pieces of this one back when this was all happening, but I really didn't know the whole story until this was kind of brought up. So let, let's get into this. So Gary Ray Bowles was a serial killer who was executed by lethal injection at the Florida State Prison in Stark, Florida, on August 22nd, 2019. Just real quick, is Stark the only place that has death row inmates? Yes, Stark is the only prison in Florida where they do executions. They don't do Old Spark anymore, though, do they? No, it's all lethal injection. Oh, okay. So, Gary Ray Bowles' first known victim was his own roommate, John Hardy Roberts, who was 59 years old, and it happened on March 15th of 1994 in Daytona Beach, Florida. Now, this set off a killing spree, which lasted approximately six months. He was coined the I-95 killer because he was linked to murders of gay men in cities along Interstate 95 from Daytona Beach to Washington, D.C. But let's rewind real quick. Yeah, let's let's go back a little bit. Let's Let's go back and talk about Gary Ray Bowles. Let's get a little backtracking going on. Now, Gary Ray Bowles was born January 25th, 1962, in Clifton Forge, Virginia, but grew up in a tiny town called Rupert, which is in West Virginia. And when I say tiny, I mean that according to the 2010 census, the population there was only 942. And his parents were Franklin Frank Bowles and Francis Carol Price Bowles. Now, Frank, his father, was a coal miner. He died six months prior to Gary being born from black lung disease, And his mother, Frances, remarried several different times. According to his mother's testimony later in court, Gary had a good early childhood. However, at the age of seven or eight, Gary began to suffer from abuse by his first stepfather. So his first stepfather gets in there, and there's obviously abuse present. Well, then she confessed that her husband was violent with her sons, often beating the boys with a belt or his fist, which is not a good childhood to start with. No, That's not how you were. I mean, that's kind of misleading there. Now, when she tried to protect them, she too became subject to abuse. So she would step in to try to help them out. She would end up getting abused as well. Now, eventually, Francis divorced and remarried again to a man named Chet. And Chet, of course, was a violent alcoholic. Because if you start those trends, that's unfortunately kind of the, the trends you follow. Now, Chet was known to frequently fly into these violent rages that were alcohol-induced and beat Gary, his brother, and, of course, Francis, the mother. His brutality resulted in the hospitalization of Gary's mother on several different occasions. And around the age of 10, Gary began to sniff glue and paint, as well as experiment with other drugs, in an attempt to escape his unhappy situation. And eventually, Gary dropped out of school during the 8th grade. So he decided, that's it, I'm done. No more school for me. When he was 14 years old, Gary and his brother ganged up on their stepfather and severely beat him with a brick, almost killing him, but his mother intervened and stopped him. She should have just let him go. It was at that point that Gary told his mother to leave his stepfather or Gary would run away. And his mother chose his stepfather. So frustrated by his mother's choice to remain in the marriage, Gary left home to go live on the streets. So now you got a 14-year-old living on the streets. And one of the first men to pick up the 14-year-old Gary while he was hitchhiking, offering him $20 to allow him to give Gary oral sex. So this guy explains to Gary that he could make a lot of money just allowing gay men to perform oral sex on him, which I don't understand. Why don't you understand that? It would just seem odd to me that if you are into prostitution, that you would be the one performing, not getting performed on. Am I saying that clearly? He would be. He was being performed on. He was making money letting gay men... Perform oral sex on him. That's what I'm saying. But usually the prostitution is the other way around. Where well, if I'm going to pay a prostitute, it's because I want things Apparently there's a market for that. Okay. And I and this isn't the first time I've heard that. I mean, I, I, I guess I understand. I'm just not in that realm. I, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there's that, that fetish because, you know, everyone has their, everyone has their kink. 
So he began prostituting himself to older gay men for money, but never quite made enough to afford a steady place to live. He remained homeless most of his teenage and early adult years. Now, although he prostituted himself to men, Gary's real interest was women, and he was known to have been involved in several relationships as an adult. He temporarily lived with one of his girlfriends, yet for the most part, the relationships were unsuccessful and at times violent in nature. In 1982, he was arrested for beating and sexually assaulting his girlfriend in Hillsborough County, Florida. This assault was so bad, the victim received fingerprint-like bruising around her neck, suggesting that Gary attempted to choke her. One of her breasts was also bitten, and her face severely battered to the point that her eyes were swollen shut. Fuck. She also received internal lacerations to the vagina and rectum. The bedroom and bathroom of the victim's residence contained a significant amount of blood, and there was blood splatter on all the walls that reached as high as five feet above the bed. The crime was demonstrative of Gary's violent nature, and he was sentenced to six years in prison. Well, in 1991, after his release from prison, he was convicted of unarmed robbery in Volusia County, Florida, for the theft of an elderly woman's purse, a crime for which he was sentenced to four more years in prison, but he was released in two years. McGarry went on to commit even more violent crimes that would catch the attention of the FBI, the media, and of course the gay population. Now, Bull's first victim was John Hardy Roberts in Daytona Beach, Florida. That's what we mentioned earlier. On April 14, 1994, Daytona police arrived at the residence of 59-year-old John Hardy Roberts, who had been brutally murdered. Roberts' badly beaten body was discovered on his living room floor. He had been strangled and a rag was found stuffed into his mouth. His head also showed signs of severe trauma and one of his fingers was almost severed from his hand. Also found at the scene, on a coffee table right near the victim's body was a piece of paper, a probation and parole notice with the name Gary Ray Bowles on it. Now, Robert's car and wallet were missing from the scene as well. So Detective Allison Sylvester was the lead detective on the case. She quickly found out what types of credit and ATM cards Roberts had and started following the transactions. Gary Ray Bowles was spotted on an ATM camera trying to withdraw money from John Roberts' account. A manhunt for Gary quickly ensued. Although the authorities were able to recover Roberts' car in Georgia, Gary was never found. The credit card transaction stopped just outside of Nashville and the trail went cold. The same day Roberts was found, a maintenance man discovered the decomposing remains of 38-year-old David Jarman in a basement of his Silver Springs, Maryland home. Like Roberts, Jarman had been badly beaten before having his mouth stuffed with a rag and being strangled to death. The victim's car and wallet were also missing. Jarman was seen the night before his death at a gay bar in Washington, D.C. with a man who matched Gary Ray Bowles' description. Well, several weeks later, Gary's trail led investigators further south to Savannah, Georgia, where they found the decomposing remains of 72-year-old Milton Bradley on May 5th of 1994 behind a shed at a golf club. A medical examination later determined that Bradley had been savagely beaten before being strangled. Like Roberts and Jarman, the victim's mouth was stuffed with material. It was leaves and dirt, and this was just before he was asphyxiated. Now, Bradley had been a well-known citizen in Savannah and recognized as a World War II veteran. Now, according to Bob Morris of the Savannah Morning News, Bradley was a quiet and gentle man who was generous almost to a fault. Now, this is Milton Bradley, not the one you're thinking of. This is a someone totally different. Not related to the toy Yeah, the game. Company. Exactly. Bradley suffered a mental condition caused by a lobotomy that he received after the war, making him more vulnerable to a man like Gary Ray Bowles. He was described as childlike, not really in touch with reality, but still functional. 
Bradley had been seen in the company of a man matching Bull's description several times in the days leading up to his murder. Detective John Best was lead on this case. He had just joined the homicide squad, and this was his first case as lead detective. Now, Detective Best recognized that the item stuffed in the mouth was a signature and maybe a sign of a serial killer. His colleagues thought his theory was far-fetched. He also noticed that the killing was close to I-95. If he's looking for an easy target or gay men who often don't report crime, the I-95 corridor was a good spot. He sent out a regional teletype alerting law enforcement across the southeast to alert him if they find similar homicides. During an investigation of the scene, a palm print that was later matched to Bulls was found. Police eventually had a name to go with the suspect's face. They matched the palm print with the man who had been arrested in Atlanta in 1986. There was little doubt that Gary Ray Bowles had been involved in the killing. Now, what, what was it he was arrested for in 1986? He was arrested for beating his girlfriend. That's right. And that was because she was... I wonder if he was, like, struggling at that time. You know, because he started when he was 14 years old, the, the sort of the prostitution thing. So I, I wonder if he, if he, if he had... Well, there was with... a thought that a girlfriend had left him when she found out that he had been prostituting himself to men. And I don't know if this is the girlfriend. That's not clear. But at one point he did beat, like we mentioned earlier, he did beat a girlfriend really bad. And that's just, that that, that can't be confirmed, which is why I didn't, put it in our notes to actually put it out there. But yeah. now that that came up, that well, I mean, is a rumor. You think, that, you think rumor. he was like struggling like with, with being gay, but being with women? Or do you think... I don't think, do think he the, was the gay, ever gay. You think he was just That's for one thing. I don't believe that he was ever gay. I think that he did... He prostituted himself to gay men because he needed money. Yeah. Well, see, I, part of me thinks that... I mean, that's what I was struggling with. I was trying to figure out if if he was struggling... With like trying to balance his sexuality, between his, exactly, maybe. and sometimes that can make you frustrated. But I, I guess that makes sense. It, it's more of a money thing. It didn't have to do with the sexual thing. It had to do with he needed money, right? And maybe he thought that gay men had money. Maybe they had money. Maybe well, they were willing to pay him. Exactly. So maybe okay, that makes sense. And I guess the the first one that he met when he was fourteen really sort of turned him onto that concept, right? And I guess he just ran with it. Well, anyway. Well, on May 19th, the body of 37-year-old Albert Morris was discovered in his trailer in Hilliard, Florida. This is 130 miles south on I-95. So now he had been beaten about the head with a blunt object and strangled. Now, Morris had also had a towel stuffed in his mouth and tied about his head. Now, Bowles later admitted he hit Morris over the head with a candy dish before he suffocated him with a towel over his mouth. Now, this is what the court documents state. Now, his car and wallet and credit cards were missing from the scene, and once again, Gary became the leading suspect in the case. So detectives show up and decide that Gary's the guy. Now, is it because of the M.O., or did they find... I guess there was some evidence that Gary had been there. I don't know. Probably because of the M.O. But it is believed that Gary hustled himself off to Morris, whom he met at a gay bar in Jacksonville. Shortly after meeting, Gary was invited to stay with Morris at his trailer outside of Hillard, Florida. Gary lived with Morris for approximately two weeks before his death. On the night before his body was discovered, the two men were seen arguing at a bar before being thrown out. Nassau County detectives, alerted by the teletype that Detective John Best had put out, contacted Best and described their homicide scene. It was at this time they decided to contact the FBI. Now, detectives met with Special Agent Harold Jones. They looked at each case individually and decided that the two murders were so similar that it must be the work of a serial killer. Now, the FBI took the lead on the case. They then connected the killing of Milton Bradley and Albert Morris 
to John Roberts in Daytona Beach, Florida. Now, real quick, does the the FBI took over because they had already established that it's possibility of a serial killer? They wanted to see if there was connections. And it's crossing state lines. You, that's right. I forgot about that. You're absolutely right. See, now that's one thing that a lot of people don't understand or don't realize, that as soon as you cross state lines, that is federal, right? And right. that's where the FBI gets involved. Right. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. So I was just curious. FBI launches a manhunt for Gary Ray Bowles. Now, later that, later that May, 47-year-old Alverson Carter Jr.'s body was discovered at his Atlanta residence. The murder scene resembled that of the other crimes attributed to Gary, bearing the same M.O. Forensic evidence linked him to the crime. So I guess there was evidence to show that, hey, Gary had been here, and of course, obviously, he had the same M.O. where there was some, you know, items in the throat. In July 1994, America's Most Wanted filmed a segment about the crimes of Gary Ray Bowles. Officer John Best from Savannah appeared in this segment. The information about Bowles' signature, stuffing items into the victim's throat, hadn't been released. When Officer Best appeared on the show, it helped him separate false tips from legitimate ones and to eliminate false confessions. Following its airing, the show received numerous responses from viewers who claimed to have information about his whereabouts. At the time, Bowles was living in a rooming house in Jacksonville Beach. His landlord saw him on the TV and called police. When the police came to arrest him, but incredibly, Bowles had a new identification. He had a tan and a mustache and had changed his appearance so much that police thought they had the wrong man and they let him go. They apparently failed to check him for identifying marks. He has three tattoos and old knife scars. Now, Gary Bowles thought he was in the clear. At Bull's last crime scene, (laughs) he had found a wallet belonging to the victim's friend. Now, the wallet contained a social security card and a birth certificate for a man named Timothy Whitfield. Bulls took these documents to the DMV, told them he lost his driver's license, and got a new ID with his photo, Whitfield's information on the photo, on with his photo on it. So he basically went in there and got a whole new identification. <laughs> Try that shit now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this is 1994. Now. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Try that shit now. But when the police went to arrest, arrest him, he had the identification saying he was Timothy Whitfield. He had a tan. He had a mustache. They, He totally duped them and made them believe that it wasn't him. You know, and... That's what, like we just said, and I was making light of it, but in, in reality, it, that, that just shows you how, how you know, people say, oh, it's such a pain in the ass now. I go down to the license branch. My brother's guilty. He said the same thing to me, was bitching about all the stuff he had to have to prove who he was when he went to renew his license. Well, that's for a reason, you know, and things like this just reiterate exactly why that kind of stuff's important. Because you don't want someone to just show up there with, you know, a few documents here and there and say, hey, this is me. And then say, oh, okay, well, let's give you a license. Well, Gary Bowles meets 42-year-old Walter J. Hinton in Jacksonville Beach in early November 1994. Now, at this point, like we mentioned earlier, Bowles was using the alias Timothy Whitfield, as Lauren mentioned earlier. Now, Bowles agreed to help Hinton move some personal items from Georgia to Hinton's mobile home in Jacksonville. In return, Hinton allowed Bowles to live with him in his mobile home. And on the evening of November 16th of 1994, this is in Duval County, in Duval County, Florida, Bowles accompanied Walter to the train station to drop off a friend. Now, early in the evening, the three men had smoked some weed and had a few beers, and upon returning home, Hinton went directly to sleep. But Bowles stayed up and continued to drink. Now, Bowles later confessed that at some point during the night, he just snapped. So I guess he just decided, that's it, I'm done, and went back to doing what he does. And Bowles went outside and retrieved a large concrete block. He brought the block inside and set it on the the table. Now, moments later, he took the block into Hinton's room and dropped it on his head. And I mean, the guy's sleeping, and he just drops it right on his head. And of course, the block fractures Hinton's cheek. That's the part where like this cheek connects to his jaw. So the cheek to jaw right there, 
it just it, just think about Ugh. that for a second. Yeah, I mean, you're, it's a, you're asleep and somebody just drops this block on your head, and it cracks that. Now after the blow, Hinton was conscious, but fell from his bed, and of course Gary begins to strangle him. He then stuffed the toilet paper in the rag down Hinton's throat. Now the medical examiner's report indicated that Hinton died from asphyxiation. It sounds to me like the block might have done some damage too, but I don't know. Now, Gary continued to live in the mobile home for two days after the murder with Hinton's body in the back bedroom. Ugh. So he stayed there and lived there while, of course... This guy is sick. Yeah, but you know, that's the thing. He's got an eighth grade education. He, he was beaten as a child. That I mean, doesn't mean... I, I understand that, but I'm saying... has this, nothing to do with the fact that he's sick. I understand that, but if you look at his history... Of where he grew up, I mean, the small town, constant violence. The, 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 it's like it, it puts him in a different mindset. So I'm not making an excuse for him. I'm just saying that I understand the mindset of, I guess you would have to have that sort of mindset to live in the same exact place uh, where you had just murdered someone who is basically decomposing in the back room. J.P. Collins was the lead investigator on this case, and Detective Collins had seen this teletype put out by Detective Best earlier that year, and he paid attention to it, of course. Seeing the rag in Hinton's throat, Collins immediately believed that Gary Ray Bowles is responsible for this murder. So he obviously right away put the connection together. Because mm-hmm. that's, again, that's a- this is a really good example of uh, police departments actually working together. Because we've seen so many police departments that don't want to share information. They don't want to work together. They, I don't know if it's a, what do you call it? A pride thing? A pride thing. Yeah. But this, we want to be the guy. This is a really good example of different agencies working together. Yeah. And it, it actually worked out. It worked everyone's benefit. And based on reports by several witnesses, including neighbors, friends of the victim, the police strongly believe that the house guest living with Jay at the time of his death was the leading suspect. So now this is a leading suspect. So following a composite sketch of the man known as Gary Bowles, police began the search because they put two and two together. They worked together and the guy says, hey, this is this is his M.O. This is everything's working. But on a dresser in the home, they found a pay stub with the name Timothy Whitfield on it. So this changes it. Now, we already told you that He had already changed all of his information to Timothy Whitfield, but police didn't really know that at the time until now, because now they, they like, Hey, wait, this is a different name. We thought this was this guy. This is MO. Yeah. And so the police contacted the labor pool where the pay stub came from and inquired about Mr. Whitfield. Just a couple days later, the labor pool calls back saying Timothy Whitfield is there. So on November 22nd, 1994, They apprehended Gary Ray Bowles, a.k.a. Timothy Whitfield, at the labor pool at Jacksonville Beach. After the interrogation began, they uncovered that Timothy Whitfield was actually Gary Ray Bowles. Now remember, Gary Bowles had already been on the FBI's 10 most wanted list for his other murders. Local investigators began to realize that they had a serial killer on their hands. Bull's M.O. in the Hinton murders matched the M.O. of all the other murders mentioned. Bulls would prostitute himself to these men, weasel his way into staying with them in their home for a short period of time, and then murder them by blunt force and strangulation and or asphyxiation. In each case, the violence used was far more than what was needed to simply kill the victim. Though they were usually robbed, there's reason to doubt that as a motive. Now, Bowles confessed to Hinton's murder orally and in writing. Now, Gary later confessed to the murders of Roberts, Morris, Carter, Jarman, and Bradley. This is a total of six murders. Now, police said that his confession, he professed hatred for homosexuals. Now, he was cocky. He bragged about his crimes and showed no remorse whatsoever. And following extensive interrogation by the FBI and state authorities, Gary was placed in a Duval County jail to await sentencing for his last known crime. And in May of 1996, Gary Ray Bowles pleaded guilty to the killing of Walter Jamel Hinton in Jacksonville on November 17, 1994. Now, there's one question I have before we go any further. I know that I I listened to some of the stuff. There was some, some, the interview where they talked to him and stuff. 
he kind of cowered down when they asked him if he'd ever killed a woman. He almost like he didn't want to oh, answer the question. So I wonder if he was so abusive to women and willing to kill men, of course, I wonder if he ever killed a woman. So, you know, I Not mean, that we know of. I mean, a serial killer, it would seem to me, I mean, they do sort of have their own MO. MO yeah. Exactly. So obviously his MO, and a lot of them have signatures. See, with him, it was more of, he would just go out, he was killing the same type of people, people that were maybe gay men or were part of that gay culture, whether they were gay or not. Some of that stuff's not verified if they, you know, they paid him for oral sex or not. So it was hard to tell if they just met, were friends, whatever. But I'm curious if he ever, if he ever committed a crime towards a woman. I mean, I know we, he, he, he beat the one, his girlfriend. Yeah. So I wonder if there was ever a murder that occurred that maybe he just didn't mention. Maybe he, you know, they said, hey, these are the ones we know. This is what we're going to get you for. And he's like, yeah, I'll tell you all about those. But there was never any mention of a woman. I just, I, I just asked the question because it's hard, hard for me to believe. But then again, I guess a lot of serial killers have a, a type. Yeah. Which makes sense if it's only particular men. And his MO was obviously something was always shoved in the throat. So there was like one signature. So I'm not going to say it was random because it almost seems like it was selective. But I was always just curious if there was like a, 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 a trend with any females or if there was any women that were murdered at that time that were unsolved, it would seem to me that maybe they could like pen it to this guy if they had the same MO of the asphyxiation with something out of their throat. Right. Well, in August 1997, while sitting on death row for the slaying of Hinton, Bowles pleaded guilty to the beating and strangulation of Roberts in 1994. So now he's confessed to six murders. Now, during the research for this episode, I stumbled upon an article by Bob Morris in the Savannah Morning News. The article was titled, Man in Black, Police, Patience, and Teamwork Ended Drifter's Killing Spree. Something he wrote made a lot of sense to me, and I'm going to read that to you now. Some experts say there are two types of serial killers, organized and disorganized. Ted Bundy was an organized killer. He put a lot of thought and planning into his murders. Now, Gary Ray Bowles was a disorganized killer. His murders were crimes of opportunity. I've always thought it was strange how some people grow up to be so good while others grow up to be so bad. Like two little four-year-old boys in a daycare center, one grows up to be a serial killer and the other grows up to be a priest. Psychological experts say that we are 20% hereditary and 80% environment. I guess Gary Ray Bowles was a product of his environment. Evil, like virtue, can become habit. Within each of us, there is a black dog and a white dog. And the one we feed most devours the other. Mm. Yeah. Interesting, that, right? That's very interesting. Yeah, I like that. that you found that was, a, that, was, that was a great quote. What was that in the... Man in Black, Bob Morris, Savannah Morning News. The article was titled Man in Black. Now, why? I guess that's what you have to ask ourselves. Why Why did all this happen? Why did Gary do this? Now, of course, they had a chance to actually talk to him, and he was pretty open about it. And that's what, the, like I said, in some of the videos that I watched. In the well, there is an episode of a show called The Killer Speaks, and it's... I could be wrong, but I think it's season two, episode four. Or five. Might have been five. Where they actually talked to Gary Rebels. Now, obviously, this was before he was executed. and It'd be kind of funny if it was after. <laughs> Stop making jokes. I'm sorry. Um, That's but what I do. It, the, a lot of information from for this episode I did get from that interview. I mean, the facts... I got from watching that. So we have to give credit to that show. And in his, in that show, he kind of explains what happened. Yeah, like I said, so why? Why did, why did all this occur? So Gary tells police that after leaving prison, he moved to Daytona Beach, Florida, where he moved in with his girlfriend and resumed prostituting himself to men as a means of income, like we talked about earlier, where he was going out and he would 
get paid to allow men to perform on him. And according to Gary, his girlfriend became pregnant but had an abortion after she learned that he was a sex worker. That's what we were talking about earlier. Yes. And so she finds out that he's doing this and goes and has an abortion. So I wonder if, not, not that I wonder, I'm almost a positive, that this apparently flipped a switch in him, making him hate homosexual men. Right. And he admitted he blamed gay men for his girlfriend's abortion. So, hey, if you guys caused this problem, not, hey, I caused this problem because I was out there soliciting you for money. You caused this problem because you were paying me to do it. Right. It's I don't want to say a double-edged sword, but really it's a, it's a, it's a win-win situation for him because he can just explain it away and blame other people. But really it's all his fault. Right. You know, but of course, I guess that's what they do. And in 2014 interview with A&E, he said, the people I've killed were all connected in the same way. In my mind, they all got what they deserved. I thought it was the right thing to do. I just wanted to kill as many people as I could before they caught me. I don't understand that. I I just, they all got what they deserved. Mm, I don't know about that. Well, I mean, and of course, that's just him sort of explaining away and blaming others for his... And I'm sure, I'm sure that there's a lot of serial killers out there or killers in general who use that same philosophy of, hey, this is not my fault. This is just what happens to it. But him. wait, now earlier in this same interview on A&E, the killer speaks this, he, he said that it was that he had seen a video at John Roberts house that made him snap and start killing. Now, remember, John Roberts was his first Victim. Was it that one his roommate was? No, it was Hardy. No. That's right. That's right. That was his first victim was John Roberts in Daytona Beach, Florida. Now he says he saw a video at John Roberts' house that made him snap. And in the A and E show Killer Speaks, he said that it was a child pornography video, which triggered a repressed memory that made him fly into a rage. Now Detective Allison Sylvester, no going back, she was the lead detective on this case, stated that there was no child pornography at the scene and no indication that John Roberts had any interest in children or child pornography. So so this was just, he was I, blowing smoke. Yes. Yes. Trying to explain away his, his, problem, his problem or his issue. Yes. And, and again... I that, think he, I think he just... Enjoyed killing. Truly. I feel like he just killed someone and he enjoyed it so much that he decided that he was going to continue doing it and he was going to kill gay men because they were his easy targets because he had already, he was already in that lifestyle. He already knew how to lure them in. And I think that he just was. A killer, like nature versus nurture. He, his. So you think he that was he was a killer? That that sort of he picked that genre, if you will, for lack of a better term, that genre of persons to because kill. because it was easy for him because he was already in that in that yeah because do we don't have lifestyle I, he already knew how to get to those victims he along the i-95 corridor just like he's been coined the i-95 killer he could get in get out move from town to town yeah and i mean that it's, it's you stay sort of on that in the i-95 or you stay on that coast or on that road if you will mm-hmm. but you're in different states and then you come back but he sort of came back to florida right Right. So he went away, comes back to Florida. He started in Florida and then came back in Florida. Game. And like you said, it makes sense because he would, he would, he, he could, he, he knew how to, to, like you said, lure these men and go after them. Now, also, do you think that it had to do with, because you, you notice that every time he, he murdered someone, he took their things, whether it be their identity or their money or whatever. So, I mean, he would, he would take their. I think that was just You don't a think means. it was robbery? No. I think that was just a means to help him get away as far as the ATM or credit cards or identification, just to, to change his identity. But if you look at the signature of 
every victim had something shoved down their throat, whether it be a rag or leaves or something was shoved down their throat. And it's hard to speculate why he did that. I mean, I have some ideas in my mind, but I don't feel comfortable putting them out there, putting them out there, but use your imagination as to why he would shove things down the throats of his victims. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with why they were lured in to begin with. I wonder, but see, do you, do you think that maybe he was abused as a child? I mean, I'm not, I'm not explaining it away. I'm not trying to make an excuse by no means. I don't know. I don't know. That's never been proven. And like I said, he says that at John Roberts' house, he saw child pornography and it triggered a memory. But then they said that they never, they did not find any evidence of any child pornography or anything of that nature at the crime scene. Probably so, just him trying to explain I think away or accuse someone else. Trying to explain else. away, yes, yeah, because he, exactly. he obviously has a record of that, and right, yeah, because there's no record of any of that occurring. Obviously, the abuse happened. We know that based the on physical abuse, but exactly. as far as sexual abuse, I don't. I don't know that there was any sexual abuse. Well, we don't have to worry about it anymore because Gary Ray Bowles was executed by lethal injection on August 22nd of 2019 at Florida State Prison in Stark. Now, he ate, like we was we heard in the trailer earlier, his last meal was three cheeseburgers, french fries, and bacon. I wonder if the bacon was on the cheeseburger. See, I don't know. Unfortunately, want- these are the things that I think about. I'd probably want my bacon on the cheeseburger. Yeah, or did he just eat the bacon regularly? Well, anyway, oh my sorry, God. I'm not. I'm not trying to make light of it. I just, I'm curious about these things, and unfortunately, that's my problem. So, like I said, he had three cheeseburgers. What this guy, this poor guy, I mean, his cholesterol level wasn't he worried about that? He was getting ready to die. Yeah, but still, I'd be concerned. I wouldn't care. Me either. I guess it's a good point. But you know, honestly, that's a pretty good meal. Really, that'd be my choice. I wouldn't pick a salad or like a prime rib or anything stupid. I cheeseburgers and fries. I well, have pizza. You would have pizza. You're, you're, she well, was trying to order Grubhub right pizza now. Pizza and chicken wings. <laughs> I'm sorry. We, we, I got way off track. Well, he left a statement that read in part, I want to start by saying that I am so very sorry to all the family and friends of Mr. Hinton. I never planned to kill him. and I'm sorry for all the pain and suffering I've caused. I hope death eases your. I hope my death eases your pain. I want to tell my mother that I am very sorry for my actions. Having to deal with your son being called a monster is terrible, and I'm so very sorry. He went on to thank his lawyers and the warden and all the staff at the Florida State Prison, stating, quote, I was treated with respect for the last 73 days on death watch, and I felt human again. You don't wake up one day and decide to become a serial killer. I'm sorry to the other families who did not get closure. I've told the FBI everything. No cases left open. And the actually, if you just do a quick Google search, this entire statement can be found. And um, I just, I kind of go back to what he said there. When he said, I've told the FBI everything, no cases left open. I wonder if that was bullshit. Well, I don't know. I honestly don't know. But, you know, honestly, I think that they've done such a great job. The detectives and the the departments work together so well that I think maybe that had there been. If there was any more out there, they they would have have connected connected it. Yeah. So Bowles was pronounced dead at 10.58 p.m., and then the Florida Department of Corrections provided his handwritten statement to the media. He was the 99th person executed in Florida since the state resumed executions in 1979. Remember they used to have old Sparky? Well, now it's just lethal injection. Lethal injection, yes. You know, honestly, this guy, I would have loved to see, you know, old Sparky. But then again... I'm different. I have a different opinion. All right, everybody. So that's our story about Gary Bowles, the I-95 killer. And um, again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Paradise After Dark podcast. And you can check out our Etsy store for some awesome Paradise After Dark gear. Please make sure to follow us on social media at Paradise After Dark podcast on Instagram and Facebook and at Paradise Dark 239 on Twitter. And you can email us, that means Lauren, at Paradise After Dark Podcast at gmail.com. Please make sure to su- 
subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening on and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. And again, everyone, thank you so much for listening to Paradise After Dark. Dark, dark, dark.